Now, I decided uh, a while ago when I came back from being on leave that <clears throat> we would uh, try to talk about mental health issues across the board. If you don't know, I'll tell you, and uh, my guests can hear this as well, I'm sure. Um, I was away on leave because I had uh, extreme anxiety and uh, I was clinically depressed like you wouldn't believe. I think I had 33 out of 35 on the test. He didn't want me to leave the office that day. It took, and I'm going to tell you, it was a two-year ordeal. This began a long time ago, and I am just really recovering now as the people that know me and have worked with me for years know. And this big guy just fell right down. And so I thought I would share that with you, as I always do. And one of the more important things to talk about is our young people. Um, Because of who I am, okay, I'm the radio guy, I'm the TV guy, I was able to get help very quickly. Most folks don't get it that fast, especially young people, because the parents and the teachers and uh, the coaches and everyone, they they really, they, they they don't know, and of course they don't know. Most people know very little about depression, about mental disorders, and the guy I have on in a second here knows a lot about it. Dr. Stan Kutcher is a professor at Dalhousie University down east, and uh, he's in the Department of Psychiatry and the staff psychiatrist uh, at the IWK Health Center. And Dr. Kutcher, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me with you, Jeff. You know, uh, I specifically wanted to talk about young people, and especially adolescents. And, Doctor, we hear a lot about ADHD and, and, and things like that, but with a growing mind and, and growing bodies and, you know, uh, that age, do, does mental illness set in that early, or is it generally something that comes later in teens or in the earlier 20s or at any time? Well, mental illnesses can come any time during the lifespan, but the mental disorders, the mental illnesses, and I'll use that term interchangeably, are the illnesses of adolescence. Most young people go through adolescence physically quite well, but the mental illnesses are the ones that come on during that phase of the lifespan. That's mental disorders, which are brain illnesses, are the illnesses that strike during adolescence. Um, my, my counselor said to me, and, and I don't know how I'd like to ask you your opinion. Um, he said, I dislike using the term mental illness. I like to talk about chemical disorder. He, he says that really most of it all is, is, is the chemicals within you that are in the brain and, and, and in your body that can't handle this or can't handle that or get overwhelmed or we don't make enough of one or the other. And, we, and, and, and it's really about chemicals, specifically, he said, with depression. Is that correct or uh, maybe not what you would agree with? Well, the brain is where our emotions live, where our thinking lives, where our behavior lives, where everything who we are as human beings in our unique sense and in our collective sense lives. We are what our brains are as a person, as a member of our society, as a member of our culture. It is all stored between our ears. And when a person gets a brain illness or a brain disorder, we call that a mental disorder or a mental illness. The brain is made up of a whole bunch of different chemical soup, just like the rest of our bodies are. Mm. And all the different parts of the brain, which work together in this incredible symphony of order that provides us with our feelings, with our thinking and our behavior, all these different things work on the basis of electrical chemical messages going from one part of the brain to the other. So when that person is said to you, yeah, there is a chemical problem going on, they're right. But it's a chemical problem only in as much as the brain uses specific chemicals to transmit the information that it carries 
within it. And, and doctor, does it, is it different for everyone? I mean, some people have a, a higher tolerance or, 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 or can, uh, what's the word, they can uh, withstand uh, extra stress or extra, uh, you know, uh, than others can. I mean, like for me, I know that I went along for a long time just thinking I'm getting older. Well, you probably I, was right, Jeff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all of us, that's one thing that's the true is that all of us are getting older every second. Well, no, the thing was, you know, I was sleeping all the time, and I didn't want to get out of bed, and I kept saying, if I keep getting more rest, I'll get up one day and feel rested. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, it, like, and I was, you know, I just was going along, and then it turned to be almost like a zombie even. I was just going to work, coming home, this and that, until... And then trying this medication, that medication, this medication, it was just suddenly one day, no, no, you're not sleeping like that because you're tired. You're yeah. sleeping like that because you're depressed. You might have heard me say I got 33 on my test. I said, hey, is that good? No, that's not good at all. <laughs> and there are higher numbers. It was the worst thing. It's like golf, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a 33 handicap, and that's no good. <laughs> well, I, I, I can relate to that. You know, but you know, th- but with our with our young people, though, I mean, uh, a lot of people are afraid these days of over-medicating or medicating young people at all. Some parents are afraid of that. I've done shows, where, and, and there's some, what of a stigma that comes with it. Uh, and in this day and age where there's so much uh, bullying and Internet and all that, does that exacerbate the, the situation? I mean, are, are, are kids more likely, and when I say kids, young people or adolescents, more likely to have issues than maybe when I was in high school? Well, the, 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 how far back are we going, Jim? Well, I was by <laughs> candlelight I was studying. I'm teasing, I'm teasing with you. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> The best data that we have shows that there haven't been, uh, in general, any substantive huge changes in prevalence. That means how common different disorders are. There have been changes in the prevalence, but sometimes those changes can be explained by the way that we diagnose and we have uh, uh, criteria which are more flexible in, uh, in some cases than, than they were 15 or 20 or 60 years ago. What we are certainly uh, clear is that we are becoming much more aware of them. And sometimes when something has been sitting under our nose for decades and we haven't seen it, uh, and then all of a sudden when we see it for the first time, we, 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 we search to find explanations which are mere correlations, and we lop onto these things because we we like to ha- have comfort in that we've explained something, even though we haven't really explained it. We, we like to think that we have. So I, I don't think that we have any good evidence that the kind of life that kids are lead, leading now is in any more way uh, causing mental disorders than lives that we were leading 30 years ago or 100 years ago or 6,000 years ago. Okay. Um, but um, certainly every generation has to face its own stresses and its own trials and tribulations. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, though, when I was in high school in the 70s, <laughs> there, th- I don't remember one person on a Ritalin or on, a, on any of those kind of things. Uh, now, they might very well have and not told us, you know, but it just... I don't know if it's any different today. I mean, there's a stigma that comes with it, and I've tried to talk about this with the audience because I, the way I put it to them is you, you have no problem uh, understanding somebody has uh, kidney dialysis. They've got a problem with those two organs. But the organ that runs everything, okay, you don't think there could be a problem. Yeah, I, I hear you. Part of that is a real real lack of mental health literacy and i am constantly gobsmacked by how frankly illiterate many people are about mental health and mental disorders it's uh, the models that people carry around in their own minds for understanding mental health for understanding mental disorders are models that modern science has left behind 20, 30 years ago. But it, the, the, the way that we understand these things hasn't percolated through uh, very well yet. The, and the other part of this, however, is also that there, there's a huge stigma, and sometimes stigma can be harsh and, 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 and attacking, but sometimes stigma can be very subtle and it can be uh, very hidden. So, for example, 
some of the things that you read about, well, kids who have a mental disorder shouldn't take medicine, that's another way of stigmatizing young people who have a mental illness. No one would ever say if you have diabetes, don't take insulin. No one would ever say if you have asthma, don't take a puffer. But it's pretty okay to say if you have a mental illness, don't take your medicine. Um, and, you know, that is both um, an attitude which is something sometimes born out of ignorance it's an attitude sometimes born out of fear, and it is also an attitude born out of stigma. I don't know exactly, uh, and we're just running up uh, against uh, the time factor here, Doctor. I, I mean, I don't know what the situation is down where you are in, in, uh, in the Maritimes, but, but here it's very difficult uh, for people to, uh, to, to get services. They have to go to their family physician if they can get one, and then they have to be referred to a psychiatrist or whomever, whatever specialist, and that could take months even. And as you know, and I know now, even when you take a, a, a drug that's for mental illness or mental disorder, it sometimes takes a ramp-up period of anywhere from two weeks to six weeks, and then it still needs to be monitored because you never know if that's going to be right. And, and, you know, it can be up to a year before st- things even start happening in our province. I don't, and, and, and I see that as... Uh, you know, a real roadblock. You know, it's a tragedy, and we would never stand for it if it was anything else but a mental disorder. Just a couple of things to share with you on that. First of all, there are lots and lots of treatments that are effective. Medicines are only one a type of treatment. For many young people, the psychotherapy can be equally as effective or even better, depending on the condition. The second thing is, is that most mental disorders, when they begin, when they, and they tend to begin before age 25, are mild or moderate in intensity, which means that if we intervene very quickly, we can often be able to intervene with treatments which are uh, very simple and easily available. Uh, and kids can respond very well to those treatments, and we actually know how to do that, and we know what works best. Now, in order to do that, three things have to happen. One is that young people, their teachers, and their families have to be literate in mental health. And we have this huge program now that's going through every grade 9 classroom in the province of Nova Scotia, and many schools actually in Ontario, I think including in Kitchener and Waterloo, are developing and using a curriculum guide, mental health curriculum guide, teaching mental health literacy to grade 9 and 10 students. And that's the place to start so kids can understand what is good mental health, what can I do to help keep myself healthy, and what does a mental illness look like, and if I'm sick, where do I go get help? That's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to change completely the way that we give care. And because most mental illnesses in young people, when they begin, are mild to moderate, as I said, they can be very, very effectively treated in primary care. We have oodles of good data to show that that's possible. We have to have primary care practices in which physicians and psychologists and nurses and other health providers are skilled in diagnosis and treatment and also skilled in identifying those kids which are too complex or the illness is too severe to treat in primary care. If we do that, we do two things. One is we increase the access to care dramatically, access to effective care dramatically, so lots of people who need help can get it. And we decant the pressure on specialty services because right now all sorts of kids are in specialty services that could be well treated in primary care, but they, they can't get into primary care, so they have to wait and wait and wait until the illness is so severe, then they get to specialty services. It would be like if I give an example. If you're talking about colon cancer, you know, we, we screen populations, we do everything that we can in order to make sure that if we find colon cancer, we want to find it in stage one. Why? Because in stage one, most people can be cured. We don't wait till it's stage four when most people can't be cured. But in mental disorders, and I think this is a lot of the stigma, it's okay not to treat someone, a kid, in stage one. You say, oh, it's okay, you got stage one depression. Ah, that's just mild to moderate. Come back when you're really severe. I mean, if we did that in heart disease, if we did that in diabetes, if we did that in colon cancer, people would think there's something really, really wrong with us as a society. Well, we do that with mental health 
problems, and we do that with mental disorders, and we've got to stop doing that. We know the answers. The answers are clear. It's the will to make the changes, which is the problem. All right. Dr. Stan Kutcher, thank you so much for your time. We're out of time.